<laughs> Last summer, I was asked the question, what is your favorite artwork from Korea? My mind went blank. At that time, I barely knew or studied anything related to that country, much less its visual art culture. Now, to give a bit of context, my name is Grace, and I am from South Korea. My family moved to Malaysia around 10 years ago, which led me to pursue an education in a very international environment. For most of my life, I loved and created art. I often found myself painting with acrylic paint, coloring with wax crayons, and sketching with graphite, all of which are modern or Western mediums of creating art. So in all honesty, when my new design mentor asked me that question, I was pretty stuck. I never realized I was in this dire of a situation when it came to understanding my, and knowing my own culture. But in reality, I've never thought twice about learning about that field either. Because for me, East Asian art was, I don't know, too distant, too old school, or maybe just too plain for my liking. So to me, good art was like this, Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. There, I saw all the elements I looked for in a perfect artwork. I love the realistic proportions of the bodies, the symmetrical perspective of the background, and the flawless balance of color. But Korean art wasn't like that. From looking at my blank expression, I think she figured that I won't have an answer to give her. Ms. Hyeon, my mentor, if I haven't mentioned already, pulled out her computer and opened up the three images that I'll show you right now. She said, tell me what you see. The first artwork that I saw that's displayed above here seemed to be a hastily finished sketch that depicted a celebration in the mountains. I noted that the perspective was kind of off and there were writings on top of it too. The second set of artworks depicted tiger, sorry. <laughs> the second set of artworks depicted tigers. I was aware that tigers were prevalent in the Korean folklore, but that was about all I had to say. The last artwork she showed me was a bit more welcoming. I realized that I've seen it before. It was a foldable screen that stood behind the emperor's seat during the dynastic periods of Korea. But I guess none of what I said seemed to be impressive for her. I mean, I wasn't too impressed with myself either. But what I tell you from now is a reflection of my most significant eureka moment as an artist. After the short conversation I had with Ms. Hyeon, she gave me a lecture that dismantled my preconceived notion about Korean and East Asian art altogether. This ultimately shifted my perception of my heritage. Did you know that unlike Western art, is who encourage their viewers to see the center, the focus of their artwork first, Korean artists suggest their viewers to see the art from the right to the left and from the top to the bottom? This is because my ancestors and many other East Asian counterparts wrote their language as such, starting their characters from the top right corner, writing downwards, and then moving to the next column on the left. This is an artwork called A Celebration to a Long Life by artist Kim Hong Do, who, well, in my case, is arguably the most significant Korean artist of the 18th century. If you view this artwork as you would do for most European art, it's actually impossible to see the importance of each of the intentionally put elements of the work. But if you see it the way my ancestors saw it, the original and intended way of seeing it, you can suddenly observe time and movement. Let's start with the mountains, these beautiful peaks that set the mood of the art piece overall. It's like an introduction to a story, like how an author would introduce his readers to the setting of the story first. Follow the arrow downwards, and our sight is led down to the celebration, and then to the people who are interacting outside of the party scene. We call this Sison Ehurim, or the flow of sight. 
like a novel and its words tugging you to look from one word to the next to complete a sound story, Kim Hongdo used the same skill set to tell a story himself. When Western artworks often depicted a snapshot or a freeze of a certain point in time, Kim and his colleagues used their materials to show the progression of a period of time. Tagging onto the idea of stories, I want you to see the next piece with me. When you first saw this artwork previously, did you spot the magpies, the seasonal Korean birds that was on the top right corner? Because actually, these magpies are essential components to the art piece that I missed when I first saw, it, saw it for the first time. From the 1700s to the 1800s, when a cultural revival happened in Korea, elites and commoners alike sought to bring back their old tradition. These were the years when the magpie and the tiger artworks started circling around the peninsula. Unlike the previous artworks that Korea produced, these were mostly drawn by commoners. When Confucianism alongside Korea's very hierarchical society only allowed for the ruling class to take part in painting in the past, the 18th century saw a surge in artists who disregarded cultural norms to, in a sense, begin their first wave of Korean pop culture. These artworks, with many being of tigers and magpies, became the commoner satire. Artists started depicting the brave and powerful tiger known to ward off evil as the foolish and often silly ruling class of Korea, while the frail and small magpies that are on the corner of the art piece symbolize the wise commoners. Behind the funny orientation of the tiger's eyes and the intricate brushstrokes of the whole composition, the artwork carried so much more meaning than what I have ever seen possible. And lastly, what I initially thought as mere landscape paintings for the kings of Korea, I realized that it was a well-constructed artwork with so much consideration for each of its elements and its overall composition. The sun and the moon are hanging down at the top, which signifies balance, yin and yang. I also recognize that both the sun and the moon being painted also could mean the long rule of the Joseon dynasty of the 15th to the 19th century. Beneath the navy sky, we see five mountain peaks. These represent the five mountains that the Joseon dynasty ruled over, one of which includes the Halla mountain of Jeju Island in the south of the Korean peninsula. And from the mountains, we see an ever-flowing set of waterfalls that abundantly replenish the lakes and the rivers of the Korean land. Now, the sky, the land, and the sea make up the three components of quintessential Korean landscapes, but to tie everything together, there is a very consistent spike. Oh, I'm so sorry. Spike in the mountain that runs through the center of the panel. So if I described what I said in Chinese characters, the writing system that Koreans use up until the invention of the Hangul, we see this. The character three, or sam, put together with a line running down its middle creates the word wang, or king in English. This artwork, this was made to be a form of blessing onto the monarchy of Joseon. It was to affirm the king that indeed he was the individual that ruled over all while being holder of peace and unity. For the past few months, I took these insights to heart. No longer did I disregard Korean art as a less than compared to the European art styles that I was so drilled to love and practice. I no longer needed to restrict myself from exploring more. And because I couldn't forget the important lessons I learned to never judge an art piece by your first scan, I decided to act upon it. And this was my outcome. For a few weeks during summer, I subconsciously used my new findings to, of my heritage to create this art piece. Only recently have I found out that it perfectly fitted into this talk. My piece flowed similarly to the first example of the artwork. You know, the right to left, top to bottom thing that I just told you about? Yeah, that. Also, we move our eyes in the direction of the arrow, and we see that from the sun 
we go down to the moon, which is also an illusion. We can spot the four mystical creatures from various Korean folk tales as well. These Korean folk ca characters actually reflect my innermost self. The mountain with its legs from the top flee from threat, for she is known to be a coward. When everyone thinks that she is the strongest of them all because of her big size and her stance, she in reality is the most vulnerable and scared. A whale taking the with the glowing horn is used, sorry, the whale with the glowing horn uses his feature to lure fishermen closer to him. He is a lonely whale, one of a kind, and he constantly seeks to comfort from others he knows will lead him soon. The monster, the number three, in the wooden barrel is casted away into the river to drown. He certainly did not need to, did not desire harm to the village he visited, but because he was different, he was a threat. But Hete the lion is different. Hete is a friend and a companion to all. He has never been hurt nor looked down upon. Hete was a hero's best friend. The mountain, the whale, the monster, and Hete lingered in me. These spirits coexist and make up a part of my identity and thus promoted me to take this art piece, prompted me to <laughs> create this art piece. As I explored my flaws through self-reflection, I found comfort in these fictional characters, for I knew that somewhere along history, there were other storytellers who went through the same hardships as I did, feeling lonely when I was among everyone else. And to wrap the whole piece together, we see the three elements appear again, the sky, the land, and the sea. One thing I kept noticing as I worked on this art piece was just how easy it was for me to follow the ways of my heritage, my roots. Within only a few weeks of reading about my cultural identity, I found myself living in it, thriving in it, living it in it to the point where I felt dissatisfied when I tried to go back to the where I used to be. My artwork started focusing more on discovering my identity as a third culture kid from Korea, and I realized more and more that the underlying purpose and the ways of thought of the world. Our world revolves around the intricate balance between preservation and change. To the Western world, whether it be in science, history, art, or technology, change or innovation has always been a big driving force in human advancement. For its Eastern counterpart, however, preservation of the past through refinements of a traditional culture has shown to be of greater importance. But Today, I am not here to say that neither of them is more right or more wrong, but I am here, rather, to appraise previous civilizations and their noble act of giving us the foundations that we stand upon today. As English philosopher R.C. Collingwood once said, history is for human self-knowledge. The only clue to what man can do is what man has done. The value of history, then, is that it teaches us what man has done, and thus what man is. We must embrace our history. We must embrace our own identity. Our international community like this is a place where we are often encouraged to dabble on multiple culture, but never to dive into one fully. But we shouldn't use this lack of resources as an excuse because if we had all this time to learn about the beauty of other people's world and their lives, don't you think it's time to know yours as well? I encourage you today to take action and connect to the part of your past that you haven't discovered or seen before. If from the few minutes I spoke to you proved how my interactions with my culture shaped me to be who I am today, I am sure that you will be too as well. So. Don't wait for a moment to come where you realize it's too late. Start today. Connect yourself back to your heritage. Connect back to your identity. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. 
Uh, we're going to take about a 10 minute, inter 10 minute intermission. Grace actually printed off some bookmarks with the, uh, the uh, painting that she did that she talked about up on the screen. So if you'd like one, I'm going to put them right down here on this chair. They're really cute and lovely. So 10 minutes and we'll be back. <laughs> 